And it's great for me to see so many familiar faces here in the audience. Uh, Admiral Mackey and Secretary Grimes and General Shea and General Wood, uh, FCA Hawaii President Corey Lindo, Chairperson Cynthia Pacheco, and the entire FCA Hawaii team. As an FCA and myself, uh, I'm, I'm particularly proud to be associated with this organization. And a hello to some of my personal friends out there, uh, like uh, Joe Decker and Nick Carangelin, Gail von Eckersberg, and Mike Vitale, and a bunch of others. So it's great to see you all here also. And a special shout, shout out to the ROTC and JROTC cadets here. About 100 years ago, I was in the NJROTC in uh, Florida, so I, I have a lot of time for that program and for the cadets and midshipmen that are here. So thank you for all that. And I'm inspired by the fact that you all are here. So fellow flag and uh, general officers and distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I start my remarks today, uh, hang on for a second here. I may, be, I may be missing my remarks. So Mike, can you, can you bring me the, the backup copy, please? All right, so thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was a demonstration of our new UASDS system, the Unmanned Aerial Speech Delivery System. So Mike Elliott over there is a pilot of the quadcopter that you saw here. Uh, he works on the Pacific Fleet team and plans and policy shop. Thanks, Mike, for, for, for that, and you can talk to him after. So ladies and gentlemen, there's a high demand for innovative use of new and existing technologies. Now I admit there probably wouldn't be much of a demand for a speech delivering UAV, but there are companies out there that are looking to deliver books and packages, even pizzas, to your front doorstep with UAVs. Getting into the Christmas season, I understand that one restaurant is flying around mistletoe to get their customers in the mood. So if you see a UAV hovering over your head, you better either pucker up or get the heck out of the way. So commercial use of UAVs may seem risky and an unconventional idea doomed to fail, but stranger things have found their ways uh, into the mainstream market. Back in 1903, of course, Orville and Wilbur took a huge risk to try to build a flying machine out of bicycle parts, yet look where we are today. This year marks the 100th anniversary of commercial aviation. Now jet aircraft carry millions of passengers to their destinations every day, and some of those parts are not made by the lowest bidder, uh, but some are made by 3D printers. So there was plenty of risk in 1939 when Igor Sikorsky built a flying machine that had to be chained to the ground so it wouldn't flip over and kill him when he first tried to hover it. His factory workers called it Igor's nightmare, and today we call it a helicopter. Now, even as I speak, the USS Fort Worth, one of our newest littoral combat ships, is heading toward the Western Pacific. She's deploying with an MH-60 Romeo helicopter and a Fire Scout. That's an unmanned helicopter. The first time that that combination, uh, squadron combination with MH-60s and UAV helicopters, Fire Scouts, have deployed to this part of the world. <coughs> Sometimes an unconventional idea can change the world, and that's something we're very good at doing here in America. After all, we worked and reworked aircraft design until we broke the sound barrier and we built our first transistors and microchips and put a personal computer on every desktop. Back in the 60s and 70s, we launched the satellite constellation into orbit, and today my car's navigation system tells me where to go. Though I have to admit, I don't use it that much because I've got Bruni, and she always tells me where to go. Uh, and of course, it was Americans who pioneered liquid-fueled rocketry and perfected it. 
Since then, we've sent men to the moon. And now with the Orion, that's not the P-3 Orion that I grew up with and loved, uh, but NASA's new big rocket that just launched, this generation of Americans has taken one giant leap closer to putting uh, humans on Mars. No doubt, innovative Americans have been pushing the boundaries in every field of science and technology since our nation's founding. And with your help, we're evolving technology and equipment to meet uh, the needs of the Navy as well, especially as we rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific, as we contend with the challenges uh, that we see coming up in the decades ahead. We're installing canes, that's a consolidated afloat network and enterprise services on our ships and submarines. We're implementing JIE, the Joint Information Environment, across the services. And we also have EyeSight, the Intelligence Community Information Technology Enterprise, to improve intelligence information sharing and fusing based on a common computing environment that were bridged to the JIE. The theme of this conference, as you all know, is assured interoperability, and that's not lost on me. When collaborating with our allies, cross-domain interoperability is a key enabler. For all the functionality in our world, we want to be able to share that functionality in a secure way with our allies and partners when we need to. We need innovative, low-cost, reliable cross-domain solutions now, and those terms aren't mutually exclusive. They don't need to be unnecessarily expensive or unnecessarily complex. One of you out there ought to be able to figure that out for us, or certainly one of these young men and women in the green right here will be able to figure it out for us soon. We're developing new platforms and equipment too, most of it deployed first right here in the Pacific. We've just commissioned the USS America, a new class of amphibious assault ship. There's also the new DDG-1000, and all three of these Zumwalt class destroyers will be based in the Pacific. We're developing the railgun for use as an offensive and defensive weapon, and we're encouraged by the ongoing tests of our laser weapon system, or laws, out there in the Persian Gulf. It's a directed energy weapon installed on the USS Ponce. Our CNO, Admiral Greenard, visited the Ponce for a demonstration, and he said if he could miniaturize it, he'd put it on every ship. And I'll add that by saying the price tags has got to be miniaturized also. No doubt our Navy has benefited from America's pioneering innovations. We certainly know that, but so does everyone else. Maybe that's why our competitors have always sought to obtain American intellectual property, legally and illegally. It's easier to copy than it is to create. That's why we've got to put such an emphasis on protecting what we've got. We've got to make sure it's protected from those who would steal it, and then, uh, as they try to catch up, to close the technology gap with us. For years, our nation has maintained a significant edge in research and development. I think that's due in part to our pioneering spirit, to our freedom as a society to explore new ideas, and also the strength of our higher education programs. No doubt that's why, during the 2012 to 2013 school year, we saw a record number of international students attending our universities, nearly 230. I'm sorry, nearly 820,000, almost a million. 49% of these students were from three nations, China, India, and South Korea, with China leading the way with almost 235,000 students. But here's the rub. According to a recent article I read, more than 80% of emerging technology, te uh, technical talent is developed in Asia, and China and India have more honor students that we in America have students. And all this right at the time when the stakes are the highest. The competition out there is fierce today, as you all know, not just in our schools, and not just in our businesses, but in the battle environment. And our nation's armed forces are looking to develop and evolve technology to meet our needs now and to meet our needs in the future. Of course, that might be easier said than done because we've had a different focus lately. For 13 year, years now, our nation has been engaged in two land wars that have demanded our concentrated effort and attention. Meanwhile, many potential adversaries have taken that time to modernize their capabilities across the full spectrum of conflict. Traditionally, we've always counted on our overmatch in capability and capacity to offset challenges of distance and initiative in areas where strife is most likely. Now, according to the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, 
that overmatch is now in jeopardy. And that's got my attention. Because, like I mentioned to the U.S. Senate last week at my confirmation hearing, I believe that America should always bring a gun to a knife fight and not a butter knife. And I believe that the best way to do this is to play to our strengths, American ingenuity and innovation. By turning our best and brightest loose, there's no challenge that we can't meet. In fact, our Department of Defense has recently started a new defense initiative, a new defense innovation initiative to go and get right at that. Now, we understand today's fiscal realities and the budget constraints we're bound to contend with. We won't be able to just throw money at the problem. We need to think about it and come up with innovative solutions that are cost effective and have the greatest potential to yield results. DOD's long range research and development plan is intended to find and field technologies, breakthroughs in key technologies, including robotics and miniaturization and advanced manufacturing techniques such as 3D printing. I know leaders like many of you have been working hard on developing solutions to the challenges we face. But right now, I'm calling for a renewed effort by industry and academia to join me in focusing on innovative technologies. So with the gauntlet throw down, thrown down, so to speak, let me talk about some of the innovations that we're testing right now. So let me introduce to you Senior Chief Will Casillas, and please look at the screens on, on both sides of me. So Senior Chief Casillas is demonstrating one such advancement called augmented reality and how our technicians today are able to, to uh, leverage uh, that technology. So you're seeing on those screens what he is seeing through uh, these goggles. He's going to hold the goggles up like he is just to make the demonstration go a little bit easier. What you're seeing on these screens is what he is seeing as he approaches an electronic assembly. Here, the augmented reality system is essentially overlaying the tech manual right on top of the electronic assembly, guiding Senior Chief through his maintenance routine. Augmented reality is already helping us train our technicians, and in some cases, apprentice tradesmen, for instance, a welder or a pipe fitter or a machinist can perform tasks at the level of a journeyman, and a journeyman can perform tasks at the level of a master. This could allow the Navy to reduce tra the training pipeline costs in terms of both dollars and time, especially for skills that are needed infrequently, such as when we're working on legacy equipment. Augmented reality may also improve our decision making and teamwork by providing information in a format that's easier to understand precisely when the operator needs it. Imagine the ability of four watchstanders to put on a pair of these glasses and fuse all the data from all the sensors into a heads up display. Now every watchstander can be a fighter pilot without leaving their desk or watch station. And I, for one, see a lot of potential in this type of technology. Thanks, Senior, for that introduction and that demonstration. Of course, you can get a lot of help from the Internet these days as well. Recently, I found a YouTube video on how to change a tire on a pickup truck. Now, I know where you're thinking, how hard can it be to change a tire? Well, in this particular model pickup truck, I won't name the model, it's almost impossible to get it to spare without knowing how to beforehand. So online here, there are dozens of these homemade YouTube videos that walk you through the process of how to change that tire on that pickup truck. Now, the cool part is you can kind of figure out which video is the best by finding the one with the most views. So one at the top there, it's got 435,000 views, and one on the bottom has got 40,000 views. The real value here is, is not just learning how to change the tire. It lies in technology's ability to harness the collective wisdom of crowds, multiplying the ingenuity of one enterprising individual to help others up the learning curve, if you will. I know our sailors are pretty ingenious as well. They're as innovative and tech savvy as the next person. How can we harness all the experience and talent that resides with our sailors to better the entire fleet. Well, some of them have signed up to be part of the CNO's disruptive thinking group known as the CNO's Rapid Innovation Cell or CRIC and doing it on their own free time. So that's a start, but how else can we leverage 
our sailors to get things done in the Navy better, faster, and cheaper. I'm looking for ideas, and I think I've come to the right place. And is there a way that we can leverage the wisdom of crowds other than our own sailors? I think so. And the obvious way is to evolve the technology that already exists to meet our needs. And we're starting to do that. So let me show you something else here. So right here, this is a mil-spec control box to operate one of our periscopes in a nuclear submarine. That's pretty cool. With the interface box, it weighs about 10 pounds. Of course, that feels closer to 100 pounds after holding it for an hour or so, but submariners don't have much gym equipment, so it doubles as a barbell. <laughs> and let me tell you that this thing is cheap, too. We got this one for an incredibly low introductory price of $120,000. That's pretty good stuff. Now, I want you to look at this. You all know what this is, especially these folks in green over here. This right here is an Xbox controller. It's a common game controller that you can buy off the Internet for $9.99. It weighs a whopping 10 ounces, light enough that even my pencil-thin arms can carry it around for an hour or so. And the really cool thing is we've adopted this in the real world on submarines to replace this. Wouldn't it be great if we could use more of this kind of thinking throughout the DOD and DON today? I think so. But it can't be a slow process like we're seeing with those 3D printers. We're just now getting serious about this technology that, for goodness sakes, has been around since the 1980s. I understand our Coast Guard brothers and sisters have 3D printers on their ships, and they're using them today to print spare parts. The other day I read that NASA did its first 3D printing on the International Space Station. And this technology has certainly come a long way. There are companies printing highly complex fuel nozzles with dozens of moving parts for jet engines that are flying you and me today, that are flying many of you back to the mainland today or tomorrow. So where's my 3D printer? Well, there's certainly demand for them in the Navy, I can tell you that. Adapting technology for our own uses is important to us, and it's a trend that's not going to end anytime soon. <coughs> you know, I had to ask my aide to put a bottle of water up here, and I don't see any here. And there, Jay Ryan, can you give me a bottle of water, please? Pretty cool, huh? They call this robot the mule, and it's controlled by J. Ryan DeGap. Raise your hand, J. Ryan. It was developed by students at Lelehua High School here in Hawaii as part of their after-school robotics program. With the mentorship of Harmony Paz, Harmony, raise your hand, uh, and Chris Kawabata, raise your hand, uh, They've integrated robotics into the school curriculum. And I know that's no small feat, and I salute both of you and all of you uh, for your efforts to advance STEM uh, education in our schools here in Hawaii. Maybe you've not had an opportunity to check out their exhibit upstairs, but if not, come up here and check out the mule when we're done. And one thing I want you to notice is that the controller Jay Ryan was using was one of these, not one of these. You can never control that robot with one of these, but you can control it and a whole bunch of other stuff with one of these. There's a lesson there, I think. Thanks, Jay Ryan, and thanks, Ms. Paz and Mr. Kawabata. <clears throat> Through STEM education programs like this, we are developing the next generation of innovative problem solvers, the next generation of Absians, and I know as I look at these young people that I believe that our future is in good hands indeed. So this year, the Navy sponsored an international competition doing RIMPAC, the Rim of the Pacific exercise out here, where sailors from the RIMPAC nations, youngsters from schools across the state of Hawaii, and competitors from all over the world came here to put their robots to the test. And while they were busy testing their performance at the convention center 
we had Marines testing LS3, another robotic mule, this one big enough to carry 400 pounds of equipment for our Marines as they move forces in the field. You probably saw that in the local news here back in July. It looked like just any other uh, headless horse trotting along the beach. So robotics is here to stay, and its usefulness in our line of work can't be overstated. The technological advances we're making today are what will give us the edge in the battle environment of the future. But there are still hurdles that we've got to get over to get to the maximum use of it. Take, for instance, all the high-tech personal electronic devices that we have access to. What do you have on you right now? You don't have to show me. I'm sure you've got a cell phone, an MP3 player, maybe a tablet, or, or, or how about one of those newfangled watches, like the name brand I won't mention, watch, and all of that. It's powerful technology that we live with, that we work with, and that we take for granted. But do you know that in my headquarters, in fact, in most places in the Navy today, I can't use most of that technology. It's simply not allowed in the buildings for our work. There's a reason, there's a real tension, rather, between innovative technologies on the one hand and our legitimate security concerns on the other hand, and rightfully so. Today, our personal electronic devices have still and video cameras, voice recording capabilities, and the ability to send that data around the world. And of course, we've got information that we want to keep closely guarded. So bringing these things together in the same room involves risk. And truly assessing that risk, truly assessing that risk, especially considering how fast innovation evolves and how complicated it is and how many different types there are requires a lot of brain power. It's easier to make a blanket policy that prohibits all of it, but that's the wrong policy. And yet there's so much value in the technology that it seems we're missing out on some real capability that we could be using to do our jobs better. Real capability that our adversaries, such as ISIL, they're using today. So what's the solution to that? The commercial solutions for classified process enables commercial components to, to be used in layered solutions to protect that classified environment. The National Security Agency is using it now, uh, providing the architecture, the component criteria, and configuration to meet IE standards and requirements. Is that the solution? Is it a new device? Is it a new set of rules? Or maybe a new mindset? Innovation is more than just the next cool widget. It's also about a different way of thinking, a cultural trait that becomes a part of the way we do business. Today we need to leverage technology in ways that give us an edge uh, on the battlefield, but we also need to evolve our mindset regarding the technology that we have and how we use it. A lot of us might cringe at the idea, for example, of eating a hamburger, especially squeezed out of the business end of a 3D printer, especially if you're a Luddite like me. But some of our sailors, they might have a go at it, maybe. And it sure could make things a lot easier in the galleys of our ships if we could. So do we start issuing what I call WADs, or wearable optical devices, to help our watch standards on the watch floor, even if that means Wi-Fi in classified spaces? Maybe I'd even embrace that idea. After all, I used this wearable optical device during the AFCA West Convention uh, earlier uh, this year. Good stuff indeed. Do we start phasing out emails and workstations for text messaging and tablets? Maybe. They're already, seeing, they're already saying that that's where things are headed. Whatever the future may yield, it's up to us to bring it to fruition. Technology provides us the means to do things in a way that saves us time, saves us dollars, and decreases risk across the board, in my view. But we have to be willing to change from the way we're used to doing business breaking paradigms and reinventing the workplace. We need industry, we need you to continue to develop innovative technologies that we can use now and into the future. We need our sailors to continue finding new ways to apply that technology, and we need DOD leaders to create organizations that are agile and willing to embrace the new innovations that we can use in the new battle environment that we get to face. Nolan Bushnell, who was the founder of Atari Games, he once said that everyone who's ever taken a shower has had a brilliant idea. But it's the person who gets out of the shower, 
dries off, and then do something about it that makes all the difference. So as I conclude my remarks, I want to encourage all of you all to take some showers more often, <laughs> dry off, and then go out and do something about those ideas you have while you're in the shower. Today, the strength of our nation depends on the synergy between our brave men and women of our armed forces who volunteered to defend our nation and our partners in industry, who come up with innovative technologies we need in the battle environment, industry partners like each of you. So I truly thank you all for what you do on a daily basis to help ensure our military and our nation remain ready to fight tonight and win. Thank you very much.